super exciting. And thank you, everybody, for coming to this. Uh, it's, it's awesome to see everybody here. Um, so getting off, it'd be awesome to hear about your background. How did you start this company? How did you guys meet? What was the genesis of the idea to, to bring all together in the startup? I mean, I think even just starting with the idea of what we're like, what is Tapped AI and what we're building. Um, so what we are setting out to do is fix touring. Um, in the past few years, there's, there's been a ton of new independent artists that have been popping up. It's really easy nowadays to make studio quality music on your phone, get it on Spotify, market it on TikTok. There's people all the time blowing up with like really simple songs that they're making. Um, so there's this new market. And this is all within the past few years, basically post COVID that this is happening to the point where now independent artists make up the make up the majority of recorded music revenue. So that whole segment of recorded music is now dominated by independent performers. And there's all kinds of stuff being made in the space. There's like, uh, if you've ever, I don't know if you guys make music, but if you ever have, there's apps like BandLab that are really nice for making music. Um, if you want to distribute, you to use like DistroKid or TuneCore or all these other stuff that's being used to help. And what we've found is that there's the kind of next big step is how do you fix touring for these guys? So for a signed artist, you could go, your, your label will set something up with you, or you can sign with a booking agency and um, like pay them to set up and make your tool. But for independent artists, especially ones who just have a couple viral TikToks, none of those options are really worth it. And, and the final option, I mean, is to just start calling venues and tell them that you have a viral TikTok and you'd like to perform. And that, that usually doesn't work out pretty well. Um, so that's like... Just to just a kind of a brief intro of what we're building. It's a it's an app that you say I build out um, tours for independent artists. So you can get on, you put in your where you perform for, and um, it's able to create uh, tours and give you estimated revenue. Um, get you in contact with thousands of venues across the country, and as of the past few weeks across the world, now we've started adding venues in Europe and Mexico and and Canada. So it's my little like. Quick background to context for it. And that's concise now, right? Like it seems like we're on this aligned mission where it's like, oh, they're gonna create the ability for somebody to be able to create a world to work through their iPhone, right? Because as he was saying, you know, an artist can now have the ability to put their music out on TikTok and tomorrow they could blow up. You don't need a well-oiled machine for you to be able to get marketed and do all these things. Independent artists have these tools for marketing, production, distribution. But can anybody name here anything for booking or getting a show? If you're a really talented um, performer here, you might just be lucky. Maybe one of your friends knows somebody who runs a venue and they're like, hey, you need to book this person. But we're building that platform that will be able to help people. And like I said, it seems concise, but him and I for the past two years have been pivoting, experimenting, talking to hundreds of artists and trying to figure out what would work. Um, to answer your question, like our backgrounds, me and him went to BCU at the same time. I was on the complete opposite side of school with live bookings and throwing events and throwing parties for like the college kids. Whereas he's on the opposite side with the engineering guys building like a music tech startup, which was basically like a TikTok for producers. So as you guys know, with videos, you can uh, see like a 15 second snippet and you can swipe through, right? Well, there was no process like that for beats. And that's what he created. You could uh, look at a beat for 15 seconds. And if you liked it, then you check it out and listen to the full beat and then you could purchase it. And uh, I had so many of my friends that were constantly telling me to connect with him. And he had a bunch of his friends constantly telling him to connect with me. I had heard of him throughout the years. And then uh, I think it's when we had both graduated. We had came back to Richmond and, uh, oh no, uh, we did the podcast. And this is a story that I love telling because the startup started from a podcast. He eventually said, screw it. We need to meet. Let's interview you for the podcast and hear about what you've been doing in Richmond. And uh, after the one hour podcast was done, which is now live on YouTube, you could check it out from two years ago. That was the first time that we had ever spoken after we were on the phone for like two, three hours, just discussing a bunch of ideas and uh, problems that were going on in like the live booking space. And at the time, it was a completely different idea. Uh, but he gave me a call and he was about to go work for Google as an engineer. I'm like, after we had that podcast, everything, I was like, there's no way this guy's ever going to call me back. He's an engineer. He could care less about this. Two weeks later, he called me. He said, yo, uh, the startup that we're working on, everybody else is going to work for Fortune 500 companies. And when you have the choice to work for a Fortune 500 company or a tech startup, what are you going to do? A tech startup whose business model was, oh, at some point we can have ads. So, <laughs> so, so I don't blame them for going there, but I was happy that that happened because then that gave him the option for us to work together. And then that's what birth tapped to what it was. At first, it was like a LinkedIn for the entertainment industry. And then it was like a badge issuing verification system for live events. And then we turned into the AI record label. And uh, we'll get into that. As, as we go further along, because that's one of the other questions. But, you know, then me and him just were building over the past couple of years. And 
uh, we just went live like last week. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on that. That's a, that's a pretty wild story. Um, so what, what was going through your mind and your life? Should I leave Google behind or should I, should I like start this, this business that somebody I've essentially just, just met? Yeah. I've, my thing is with any of these fan companies, like they don't, they don't need you. But none of those guys need you, nor will you be the smartest person in the room ever. Like you, you're, you're not really going to be moving the needle very far. Google has 400,000 employees and you're going to be one of 400,000. That's not, that's not super awesome. And then even in college in Richmond, Capital One has a, has a big presence. So I was like, where I was working at Capital One when I was going through like grad school. Um, and again, it was like, yeah, you, they pay you well. It's nice. You move the needle like for uh, some random call center somewhere. And it's like, okay, that's fun. Um, but it doesn't, it feels different when you program something and then get immediate feedback on whether it was good or not. Cause like you could, you could go 10 years working at Capital One or Google or any, like just pick a five, which five better company and not know if you actually move the needle. And most people don't. That's why I think it was a bit, a big thing with Elon coming to Twitter and like firing everybody. Like, um, the whole point being like in his mind, like those guys weren't moving the needle and it hadn't been for a while. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what it feels like as a dev. So, um, that's when, what really started me uh, getting into startups. And at the time when we started working together, that was like, okay, I want to do this. I want to do this. And uh, even around that same time, I quit Capital One to work for another startup called Audience. And that was a music tech startup. So that really started pushing me in the like, kind of professional music scene. I wasn't in the music industry per se. I mean, I guess you can kind of consider the music industry, but I was still like a software dev working with artist managers and whatnot. Okay. Uh, and being able to program a feature and then next week have my friends update their app and see the feature feels a lot better. Yeah, that's a really interesting kind of background in terms of complementary <laughs> skill sets. I can see why your friends are telling you to get together. That's that's super interesting. Did you get into this, like putting parties on and events on and like having artists come during college or was that something that you did on the side before? I'm really curious about that. It was during college. I don't even know if I can say this, but it's been a couple of years now. So I guess I'll tell the story. <laughs> but at the time uh, I was running like a blog because I saw that especially people in our age were starting to digest or take news from social media. You know, 18 to 25 demographic is not watching Fox or CNN or whatever news source you take in. You're going on Twitter, you're going on social media. And I had noticed that like eight years ago, but there was nothing really built for like men in that demo. And so as I built up that blog, I then uh, got approached by an artist team to throw uh, or like promote one of the events. And all I had done was just like blog work and building this stuff up online. I never knew that it could translate to anything in person. And so I'm around 18 or 19 years old at this point, which they don't know. And we promote uh, for Money Back Yo at the time because he was in Richmond. And we helped sold out the show and brought a completely different crowd from what they were used to. And so then they pulled me to the side and they were like, uh, are you guys the guys who are promoting this? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, you guys want to do it every week? I was like, sure. <laughs> yeah. And then they were like, okay, it's going to be 21 plus. And I was like, well, that's an issue. He's like, why? I'm like, I'm 18. <laughs> He's like, well, we've never done an 18 plus event. So then we started doing 18 plus events and we were the first venue in the city to do an 18 plus uh, event. And obviously like when you're a senior, you're a junior, you're going to be like, oh, these cringy ass freshman par oh, pardon for cursing, but you know, these cringy freshman parties. Right. And, but at the end of the day, it went crazy. Four weeks later, the, the line was down like four blocks because there was nowhere for those people in that age range to go, right? And so then we started building up with that and then it just kind of worked. And I was like, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do now. That's interesting. So did you guys both identify this need independently or did you identify it together? The reason why I ask is that it seems like you saw it from two different sides. One from like your kind of like music booking like side and then you're from actual like the venue itself. Mm -hmm. And so were you having a hard time booking venues and you saw this from like the music side or how did that idea actually come together? Well, it was a little bit of both because when we originally start, well, like, started working, you know, the, the idea two years ago was we're going to have a LinkedIn for the entertainment industry, mm -hmm. which is very different than what it is yeah. now. And, and it's like everything, everything was a little different. We've had a lot of like, I will call them experiments. They're not pivots, they're experiments. <laughs> yeah. experiments. That's what we like to say, we experiments. Like, if it's not um, along the way and it's um i we knew that our uh, that we saw this both of us independently saw the rise in independent artists like both of us saw that that record labels the business models are changing and all these independent artists all these niches are popping up like somebody record labels do i mean they're like agencies like they do everything they're very holistic um but for a tech company you have to take out very, like you have to go for individual slivers the the motto being you build a feature then an app then a platform you have to find the feature that you're building first um, so if all these artists don't have a record label, that's a ton of features that are open to be built. And so that's what we were kind of going out for first. It was, um, 
setting out with like a, he mentioned the um, LinkedIn for the entertainment industry. Really. We talked about like AI record label, which was mostly like a big name for a lot of different experiments. We tried um, like, do they need help marketing? But we found out like, as we kind of went through, there was other players who were doing it significantly faster than um, what we were doing. It didn't fit our skill set very much. So we just tried everything and got really got into booking. Like lean, eventually, especially in, in last, like in 2023, we started leaning more and more into our, into our strengths. So like my grad degree was in like data science, machine learning, that kind of stuff. At, at Capital One, I was a data engineer dealing with like big stuff in S3. His, he's really good at booking. Like he's really good at promotions, events, like that's his thing. And so what we're doing now complements both of those. And that's how like, if, even with us working together, we kind of converge together. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome. And, and these experiments, not, not pivots, were they kind of spurred by listening to your customers or how are you getting the ideas for this? Or was it yourself? I'm just curious, like who was giving you those ideas? I think it's a mix of both. Like there were times where we were working on something and even if there was a little bit of interest, we would just be like, this is, this just doesn't feel right. This is not it. And then there's also been times where we had, I mean, even with the AI record label, we were making um, around like a thousand dollars a month within like the first two weeks since we launched. And obviously that's not massive, but for like one week of going live and being able to see that much traction, you would think you would want to keep going with that. Um, but we just kept talking to more customers and we realized that that wasn't really what they wanted. They just wanted to be a part of it because it seemed exciting. And so when we made this, especially with this pivot of being able to, you know, look at all these different data points on performers and venues, they're not a part of this because it's exciting. They're a part of this because there's actual value in the product and they will use this to be able to make better educated decisions when it comes to booking an event or performing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the working together has been, has been wild because Ilias dreams big. That man is a dreamer. <laughs> he's got some really ambitious goals and he wants to make it happen. And he's like, I got a program. Let's make like, let's go. <laughs> uh, hey, so let's, let's see, let's see how this goes. But my kind of thing is if I'm going to spend a significant amount of death time building something, like I want it to be worthwhile. I'm not going to do it. If, if five, 10 people get on that at that point, just do it and have a human do it. Like the whole point of tech is to scale. I want like, I don't want five subscriptions or 50 subscriptions. I want 500 subscriptions, 5,000, 500,000. Um, so it's trying to figure out that's like how we can build something that's good. Like it's, we've built a lot of things that are good. Like nothing that we've built, I think is inherently bad. It's had users like people have paid for it. It's cool, but nothing that like just uh, scales crazy. And I know with the last, last couple of experiments, we, we were definitely honing in because it was my, my big question. And I think this is like uh, YC, what they ask, what they have all their founders ask is ask their customers. Um, if I took this away, would you be upset? Like if you no longer had this thing, like would you be significantly impacted? And, and I'd say at the start of the two years, the people would probably would have probably said, no, we weren't even asking that question at that point. Uh, but now if somebody's uh, like, we did some good signals that we were feeling is whenever subscriptions started failing, we didn't have to reach out to them to tell them to like repay or like fix your card. They would realize that the service was not there anymore and they would fix it themselves. Or if the app was online, we got significantly many people hitting us up saying like, Hey, Hey, is, is something going on? Like, I think my house, like something's going on. Like we hit that stuff really, really quickly. So, um, and along with just interview, um, a user interviews of asking them, like, if we took this away, how would you feel? And putting that to the test when it does go away, they feel, they feel. So when did you, when did you start noticing that traction of picking up, as you mentioned, the traction, like wasn't always there in the different iterations of the business. Do you feel like this iteration that you're on right now? Like with the booking, do you feel like that traction is, is picking up your expansion into other countries and, and across the US? Like, where do you see that point? It's one with uh, something else that uh, that we've been doing is at the start of the two years, at the start of us starting to work together, this man is great at sales, like can sell anything to anybody. Um, so we were like leaning into sales a lot. Like we could make we could have made garbage and like sold it to people. like that's it, it, as a salesman like that's you can do that um but every single iteration it was let's do less marketing less marketing less marketing less marketing and to the point where now we don't do any marketing it, we didn't even announce that we were building this until over the weekend when we were in new york and we ran an event until people would be like had this whole tech mixer where we told people what we were building before that it was just whatever word of mouth. Like I didn't even tell people that there was a paywall or there was this premium subscription. I just updated the app and people saw it and they, they bought it like complete random, saw the paywall and bought it and then told their friends to buy it and then told their friends to buy it. 
uh, to the point where now everybody that gets on the app, I have a script that runs that everybody that gets on the app, I send them a DM that says like, hey, I work for the, I work with the engineering team. <laughs> if you have any issues, like you should totally let me know. Um, and they all tell me like, oh, so-and-so referred me or, you know, this guy referred me. I have no idea who they are, but um, it's all just word of mouth now. And that's how you can tell if things are really scaling up. So if we tapped on the gas a little bit, we like exponentially get more users. Um, you don't just, with no marketing, it's very hard to get like a thousand users out of the gate, but we can get it. We got a thousand users out of the gate. So good signals. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and you work with both, because it sounds like there's like, there's two, like two big components of this. You have the venue itself and you have the artist. Mm -hmm. So do you work with both? Do you like work with the, the venues independently and the artists independently or do they come to you? Like how does the whole matchmaking process work? Well, right now we're trying to focus on one. Like mm -hmm. that's something he's always big on because as he was saying earlier, I want the whole ecosystem built now. Like I wish we could have everything going crazy at once. But for us, our main focus is just on the performers and being able to get them as much data as we can on venues. Mm -hmm. So then they can pinpoint exactly where they should perform. Like ideally, um, what we would want is, let's say you have like a big demographic in Japan, right? But you don't know any booking agents or any promoters there. We want you to be able to put your pin there and then you can send a message to all of them or look for openings for slots. Whereas beforehand, you can't do that unless you know somebody. And so by the end of the year, when we do end up um, fundraising for a pre-seed round, that's when a majority of the funding will be focusing on uh, getting more data on the performers. So that way it brings more value for the venues. Because when you're building a marketplace, you have to show love on one side before you can get the other side. And right now we have a lot of performers, but we want to keep honing in on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Marketplace is a hard. Marketplace yeah. right. If you think about building a marketplace, change your plan. Yeah, don't change build it. Marketplace. <laughs> don't, don't build a marketplace. There is a whole venture, there's a whole venture capital ecosystem around funding marketplaces because they're hard. They're very good. Like once you have an established marketplace, it's hard to unseat it. Like that's why it's like Verbo's never gonna see unseat Airbnb. It's why eBay, when it when it finally got stood up, Amazon with all the resources it had in the world couldn't unseat eBay back. I think it was like, I, I forget when they tried to do it. It was like 2006 or 2007. Um, tried to build an eBay competitor and couldn't. Marketplaces are very robust, but they're hard to get started because you have two different value props. Um, and we didn't want to get stuck with two different value props and having two different customer sets and getting pulled between us because it's just like, we don't have all these resources. If you're Airbnb, you do, but we don't. So uh, we're starting off with honing in with performers, getting it, it, building some kind of value prop for them that doesn't require venues to get involved. Like, all right, let's, you know, we, we have our own data sets of venues. Like we have you know, thousands of venues on a map, including contact uh, info, ticket prices that uh, in general, who they're normally booking, stuff like that. But we don't need the venues to get it. We can, we, we can automate all that. So about, and then build it for the performers. And then as you get a substantial number of performers, then you can go and say, all right, we have, we have one side of the marketplace. Let's, let's make that leap of faith and go to the other um, and then try to get something. And if all goes to plan and the stars align and you get both, then you're unstoppable because then the more you get from one, the better the other gets. And then you're like, you're in an Airbnb and you're unstoppable. But getting to that point is very difficult. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome. And you, you, you said that, pre, you mentioned pre-seed. So are, are you all on the point that you're looking to get funding? Have you been self-funded? Have you already raised money? Like, what, what does that all look like for me? Let me tell this story because I think this would be great for them to listen to. I was living in LA at the time and he was living in Barcelona and we were running this startup. It was completely bootstrapped. Because uh, if it were up to me, we would have given like 60% of the company. Well, you know, I'd be like, give it to this guy, give it to this guy. Let's just, let's just go. And he was like, he's like the anchor. I always call him the anchor because if he wasn't around, oh my God, who knows what the startup would be doing. But he, uh, he was saying like, dude, we have to bootstrap the whole way. And so I was like, dude, I just don't want to bootstrap. Let's just get some funding. This will be so much easier. We ended up bootstrapping and we had a talk. And I was like, look, if we're going to build this startup, I can't be talking to you at 11 p.m. at night. And then I'm sending you like 30 texts and you're waking up. And when I'm asleep, I wake up to 40 texts and back and forth. It's like we were on two different times. It's, it's a nine hour difference. Yeah. And so I told it's him, an aggressive I definitely button. was not moving to Barcelona. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I told him, I said, look, you can move to LA. We could do this or, or we got to get something figured out. And he was like, to be honest, I'm down to move to the East Coast. I think that would be the best place for us to do it. And so then I ended up quitting my job. And while I was at LA, I was just doing a bunch of freelance work and I run like a creative media company as well. And so I was just living off the funding there. But uh, when I ended up moving back to uh, Virginia, which we're at right now, he ended up moving back there as well. And it's a lot easier. Like he went from being on Elm Beach, living on his own, making money, 
being in Barcelona, and now he's at his mom's house. Stop that. And I was, just playing, I was going to crazy events. I was having a great time, and now I'm living in my mom's basement. And these are the things that you have to do and have to sacrifice in order to be able to, I mean, if you don't deserve the success that comes with it, if you're not going through the trials and tribulations that come with it, obviously. And so for the rest of the year, him and I decided that we're not going to take any funding. We're going to bootstrap. We're going to be in the same time zone. We're going to live with our families and save as much money as we can. And then when we have the website to where it needs to be, where we have the app to where it needs to be, to where we have thousands of users and to where we have paid users, why would we need funding for that when we could just hold off for as, as long as we can until we hit that ceiling? And now to answer your question as well, we're finally starting to hit that ceiling where we've done all those things and we've hit those checklists. And now we do need a little bit of funding, but we can still hold off for a couple months. We're fine. Um, but yes, at the end of the year, that is when we will start you know, something a little bit more aggressive. Okay. Yeah. And uh, do, do you guys have multiple team members or is it, is it just you two right now running business? Or we like cycle through. Like okay. team members are wild. Teams are wild, especially when you're like Elias and I, and we're very creative in how we pay people because we don't, like I tell you, <laughs> it's, it's, it's supply and demand. Don't pay somebody in something that you have a very low supply on. Like if, if somebody, if we ask somebody to, hey, do you mind doing some part-time work? And they already have a full-time job mm -hmm. and we're a bootstrap startup. They already have money and we don't. So we're not going to pay them in money. That's, that's, that's definitely not happening. Um, we don't have money and they, they won't appreciate it because they already have money. Um, so I, I've helped engineers get nice engineering jobs. Like one of our interns started working at Apple. Apple, yeah. Um, that was crazy. That was, was cool. Crazy. Like I have done so many resume reviews and helping people get into startups or, or finding people like, hey, a buddy of mine needs a, a, an app for XYZ. He's got deep pockets. He'll pay you 10K to make this. Like if you help me out, I'll get you that. I'll, I'll so like, we, just to be clear, we are very transparent and we're very short with the programs as well. Like yeah. whenever we do bring somebody to come on and help us, it's usually no longer than six weeks and they know what they're signing up for. Like a couple weeks ago, we brought in a couple interns. I think I told them maybe eight times, this is an unpaid internship. We will give you a referral. We'll try and get you within our network to get a job. Are you sure that you want this? Okay. First call done. Second call. Are you sure that you want this? Okay. Third call. Are you sure this is what you want? Because the last thing we want is for somebody to feel like they're taken advantage of. And if it ever seems like they're uncomfortable, we're, we're never going to have an issue with them leaving or trying to find a way to make it work. Like with some people, uh, there has been instances where they were like, look, I was able to do this for free, but now it's getting in the way of my full-time job. I would like some contracting and, or like, I would like a referral here. Or can you connect me with this person? We always make it work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So when you, when you do end up raising the money, um, confident you will, will you, will you be bringing on to members? Is that the point of raising the money or like, will we be going to like building products? What, what, what do you think that, that future plan looks like? Bringing on team members. We have a, a like, um, a couple of engineers that we definitely want to bring on, mm -hmm. um, just for like help building the app. A lot of the behind the scenes is, um, like pretty data intensive. Um, we do some like right now, like large data jobs, not as big as like, I, mean, I say large, but I would think of what, like that was large data jobs. These are like large first startup, I guess. Um, as well as like, um, yeah, just keeping, keeping like the, like we want to move over to like having a website and having somebody do all that. And right now I am the dev team. Mm -hmm. um, and so having like, for me, it also helps, like you were talking earlier about like, do you want to have like bookers and, and performers on for me, it, keeps it like the, the amount of surface area to dev on, I want to keep as low as possible. Because if we start having a website and then an app, and then also this portal for this guy, and then also this other thing, and then also these like data jobs running in the background, that's a lot of surface area and that's a lot of bugs. And that's going to be people texting Elias on Instagram saying like, why isn't XYZ working? And I'm like, XYZ is not a priority right now. I'll do it tomorrow kind of thing. Because I have these other fires that I need to put out. So. Um, right now we keep surface area extremely small. Having other engineers would let us expand. Okay. And, and how, how do you think about that expansion of your, of your business? Do you have a certain area that you're trying to source talent from? Is it from friends or from referrals or are you going to a school? Like how do you, how do you plan to find that technical talent? Yeah. For technical talent, it's a lot of my, like my own network. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I've been at startups. I have they, people at Capital One who would, don't want to work at Capital One anymore. Um, who like especially the startup people who always want to challenge like the startup i was at before this is is kind of matured and doesn't feel as much of a startup anymore and so a lot of the original guys who want who want that like startup pace um either them or, or friends of friends word of mouth uh, that's really that's that's reasonably pretty simple mm -hmm. and at least how do you mostly get leads for 
um, like music people that you have? Is it mostly Instagram? Yeah, I guess for, I guess on my side, it's mostly Instagram because anybody who's tech related or whatever, I don't even have an opinion. I tell him, I give him full control and he gives me full control whenever it comes to anything music related. Um, and I would say word of mouth too, like especially in the music industry, word of mouth is like the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Um, we have like a couple friends that are helping us right now, like six, seven friends that are like, I would say like the core. Um, and those are just people we've known for a while and they've just been seeing what we've been working on and they want to help out. Um, but other than that, it's just through word of mouth. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I mean, that's what it seems like, right? You probably listen to the same startup podcast like I do, but they always seem about like using their networks first, bringing people they trust and know. So yeah. to totally, and totally good. That. The first, the, the one thing I learned from the last startup I was at, at Audius is the first 10 hires have to be like hit every single time. It's not like you can have nine good ones and one okay ones, like the first 10 have to hit. Um, or else like nothing else, like as you scale up, like nothing, things just stop working. Mm -hmm. um, and so we take it very seriously. We've had a lot of people hit us up for work. I've, I've had a lot of like um, part-time engineers who like want to help out and like really are passionate about the thing. Like they love tap, they, they're willing to do whatever they want, um, but we're very picky, especially when it comes to engineers, we're very picky. Mm -hmm. um, so, because we want those first one hires they had every single time. Yeah, yeah. Question for, I guess, maybe maybe finding a, because we're in an MBA program, mm -hmm. so like finding like a co-founder, maybe even a technical co-founder, how would you <laughs> recommend like somebody maybe who's in a business role who wants to find that technical co-founder? Like, how would you think about reaching out or incentivizing somebody to say, yeah, you already did it. Uh, how, how, how did you go about that? And how do you recommend somebody go about finding the right technical co-founder? I mean, for myself, I think I just got lucky because like he just so happened to also be interested in the idea. But if you're going to start a business, I wouldn't say uh, a technical co-founder should be the reason that stops you from making a business. Like build the business first and then you'll find that person or they'll be attracted to whatever you're doing. Because like for me, he probably wouldn't have worked with me if I didn't have my media company beforehand. I was throwing events and I was doing stuff and then built that. And then, then he was like, OK. We're this other thing we want to build separately and focus more on this. This makes sense for me to work on. Like nowadays, um, you can just hire like a technical co-founder from overseas, but he's not just a technical co-founder. He's more than that. He's a CEO of the company. He can make good decisions. He's also good at talking. So if you're just looking for somebody to just do tech work, well, then that's fine. You can go get somebody from anywhere to go do tech work for you for relatively cheap. Um, but I'm curious if anybody in here has ever had any barriers like that and maybe it didn't work out for them. Like if they did hire somebody, no. I think working with contractors overseas is always a little challenging, uh -huh. um, especially if you're like new to tech and product management. Like you have to be very prescriptive when you work with agencies. Like just because the like you, you said A B C mm -hmm. and they didn't think about D because you also forgot about D, like mm -hmm. they'll give you exactly what you put in. And that's so what that, happened that, to our friend. That, that is a he got scammed, yeah. like scammed for like 40 grand because there was a language barrier. Yeah, um, this is a, you uh, got to yes. ask. Yeah, <laughs> I'll try to keep it brief because it's like, I could talk about this for an hour. This is ridiculous. This is insane. <laughs> but in my two years, I've gotten creative. Uh, I like, I, I, I've done a bit of um, engineering contracting on the side. And Ilias brought me somebody from, from LA. He was like, hey, this guy has a really great idea. He's got this app. He's like having some struggles with his dev team. He's wondering if you can come in and help him out. It's like, yeah, sure. Like, Let's do it. I'll help, I'll help a friend out. Um, I get there. This guy hired a dev team in Iran. They only speak Farsi, so every single call has a translator in it. Um, the startup, he paid them 30 grand at the start, and um, they did everything on Microsoft Azure, and it cost them 600 a month to run all the services. Um, whenever he has, like, hey, I need this fix or this fix, there's usually around a few weeks, if not a few months of wait time. Like, he's very clearly not their only customer. And he has no users. So um, I, I got on the call, uh, didn't know what to say for an hour, and he asked what his recommendations were, and I said, shut down your Microsoft Azure account and restart with somebody from the US. <laughs> like, that was it. I was like, I'm about to save you $600 a month. <laughs> and how much does he, and so now he has a technical co-founder yeah, no, and he charged him like 10K to make a better version of the app, but the idea still is there that you, yeah, at least he yeah. started on something and maybe he lost a lot of money, but now he's going to go, look, he right? learned that was an expensive mistake. Yeah. That was a very expensive mistake. And I've, so Ilya speaks, uh, you speak Dari. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I told him about what happened in that call, he was like, I would have paid him money to be on this. Cause I was like, try, you can't even argue with the guys in, cause they speak Farsi. Like you can't even be like, bro, in the. I was like, can you please just give us a source code? I'll run it myself. And they were like, no, we, that's going to cost you another 15 grand. What? You don't even have the source code, bro? You paid them 30 grand. What are we doing? 
that was a that's a mess. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. So he's now like I connected him with somebody who lives in Seattle, who like Ilias was saying, charged him a fraction of the price and gave him a significantly better product that actually has users now. That's a wild story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, MVPs. MVPs are big. I, I talked with a VC who would only invest in a company if she saw that their MVP was in Google Sheets. She was like, I don't want to see anything programmed. I want to see you build the MVP. Like, it's obviously user experience is going to be awful. Um, but conceptually, show me what you built in Google Sheets, like with just the numbers going on. Because like most apps are just like Google. Like, they all have a database. So most are just Google Sheet wrappers. You want to talk about ChatGPT wrappers. These are all Google Sheet wrappers. Um, so build the thing in Google Sheet and then they'll invest. And that doesn't cost you any money. Yeah. So the takeaway is don't spend thirty thousand dollars, but a dev team in Iran. Yeah. Unless you speak Farsi. Unless you speak Farsi. <laughs> Unless you speak Farsi. <laughs> so you guys seem to have some pretty defined roles, which which I think is great. Do you guys have ever like have any friction in the business? And then how do you deal with that friction? Because you guys are still obviously together. Mm -hmm. And I think most startups fail because the founders like basically break up. So how do you guys deal with that much yourselves? I think there's like a respect for each other because we are both from completely different worlds. I mean, like I might do some like wonky marketing stuff, like when we had the AI record label be like very like loud and crazy. And he and like in the tech community, obviously there's some people being like, yo, he needs to tone it down. And he, he always defends me. And that's why I respect him so much because it's like, he just trusts that it'll work. Sometimes I'll do like some crazy marketing gimmick and it may not make sense to everybody, but then two, three weeks later, then it starts to make sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the same goes for me. Like when people are like, yo, what's going on with the app? Why are there no updates? Or like, why is this not working? I'm like, he's working on it right now. He's got a bunch of things going on. And so I think the foundation is that there's like respect on both sides and then just being able to also make that known publicly. Like I've seen some startup founders like, Let's say we have the same dynamic, right? And some of them might be like, oh man, Elias is crazy, man, doing some wild like marketing stuff. He shouldn't be doing that. No, he never says that. And even with, let's say on the opposite side, there could be somebody that says like, oh, Johannes isn't working on that. No, no, there's an understanding, there's things going on. And I think that's what'll uh, be able to keep like that unit strong because me and him rarely ever have any conflict. And when we do, him and I are both pretty confrontational to where we could be like, okay, here's the issue. Forget the issue, how can we solve this? And mm -hmm. I think that's what been able to help us yeah. for so long. Yeah. And then even I think, I mean, just like echoing what YC tells every time, it's like exactly you wanna you wanna divvy up responsibilities, like one person's got this, one person's got that, and then respect that the other person knows what they're doing. Yeah. Um and even for us, like I, it's finding that perfect split. I say both of us are pretty good at product. That's like one of the areas where both of us like have had like like both of us are, are good at like deciding like what should be in the app. Like I know from a technical standpoint of like I was saying, I'm trying to reduce surface area trying to keep it as small as possible. He's got way more customers hitting him up than me up. So he got he gets like a flood more customer feedback. So you have to have like that respect that he was saying of like, I know what I'm doing with building an app. Like at least if I build this XYZ feature, that's like so much more surface area for me to dev on for not a whole lot of gain. Like I understand that there would be gain, but it's not the pros don't outweigh the cons. And same for him when he says something and I think it's a little wonky and I'm like, I can do it, but like, why would we build that? He's like, you've got to trust me. I'm yeah. like, you got to trust me. Um, say for like, yeah, when I'm, when I'm debbing, like, obviously, I mean, if you don't look at the source code, maybe my source code, can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, same for the marketing. One of the, like a lot of engineers I know aren't created viral marketing because it makes them uncomfortable. And this is just like, the, yeah, just like make someone comfortable. Like I, w I went to grad school. I'm not doing crazy marketing stunts like this and the other. I do things. I read research papers. I kind of do things by the book. Um, but that's why he's very effective at getting users like extremely quickly is he'll run some viral marketing campaign and people just flood in like in drones. And I could not do that. And we didn't even do it for this idea until like last weekend. Like yeah. He was saying like we were doing a lot of marketing beforehand with mm -hmm. the other products. But for this, we haven't. So when we finally start to put the gas like we have been this weekend, we just lightly tapped it. When we really go crazy, I think it'll be yeah. like 10 times. I mean, it helps. I don't think you you, you said at the beginning, but Ilias has like a media production company yeah. like that he started before this that has like some ridiculous number of, of like impressions. Like what is 80,000 or 80 million, yeah. 80 million impressions online, like something egregious. Like this, you've done influence marketing for the White House. You've done... Uh, what was the other stuff? We, uh, we have it on our I don't want to talk about it. No, no, you have it on the graphic if you want, or you can uh, ask me. Virtual concert for Pusha T, media for the uh, Super Bowl. Like, you, you can, you're good at marketing. <laughs> when you tap on the guest, it's a rough tap. And you still, you still run that company at the same time? So now it's delegated. So we brought in, it's called TCC Entertainment. You guys can check out the website if you're interested. But we brought in 
um, one of my other co-founders, Eli. And so he had like a massive influencer agency. Mm -hmm. And so when we acquired him and brought him in, he's been able to run most of the organizational stuff. And then my other co-founder, Phil, who runs like all the content and social media and like event management kind of took over when I started focusing more of my time towards tap. So it's kind of good right now because it can run on its own. It's a very lean agency. And I mean, right now we're like in the perfect position because when we do end up getting more involved with the marketing, that's just like a call away. And then it funnels into what we're doing. Yeah, it seems like you get the perfect agency already lined up to do some marketing at first. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's nice. And we've had some people who are interested in investing too. And it pains me because like I was saying earlier, like I, I would love to just give a chunk away, but we just have to focus on like bootstrapping for as long as we can until we hit that ceiling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so did you guys always know you're going to be an entrepreneur or was that something you, you thought you were going to do in the future? Or did it just happen by circumstance? I'm kind of curious what you thought about that as you're growing up and going to school. I wanted to be an astronaut. I was obsessed with space. Something <laughs> not that coming, the honest. complete opposite. <laughs> Shout out to you guys, if any of you guys are in, obviously from the business school, but maybe to the people who are watching online. I wanted to be an astronaut and I wanted to be a lawyer. And obviously that didn't work out. I, I don't think when I was younger, I had any entrepreneurial spirit. I think that formed when I was in college. Mm -hmm. For me, like I was just playing video games all the time uh collecting pokemon cards um just i think yeah like <laughs> maple story playing call of duty i was obsessed with video games and so i think the the reason why i like business is because like you're taking something from zero to one and like with video games you're constantly leveling up or building your character and going from zero to one and so maybe that's the connect for me but i know for him he was doing crazy stuff when he was a kid i was i was uh i played a lot of legos yeah. <laughs> that was that was my engineering stuff i did i always like i would say i always focus more on like like just building things and and like I mean I made the, the Legos joke but yeah like and then getting in a, a college I it was I thought I was going to be a physicist because I kept all, I was also like super interested in space I thought I was going to be a, chem a chemist and at least like this story because um, when I was in high school I I guess you could call this entrepreneurial um, I learned how to make um, very inexpensive rockets um, it is there's a fuel called R candy and it's like a hobbyist rocket fuel that you can build. Um, and instead of having to go to a, a whatever store and buy model rockets, you can make them for significantly cheaper. And so I was building, and you can make them custom um, and add whatever you want to them. And so I was building rockets all the time and, and selling them to high schoolers who really wanted, who really wanted rockets. The like future you Um So that was, I guess, you can call it entrepreneurial. But um, like, yeah, it was mostly like I just liked building it, and I I enjoyed the chaos, and I liked scaling things up too. Like especially building those rockets. Um, really my lean getting more and more into software was um, I remember one night don't ask why I built 90 of those rockets 90 and that was a long that is a long time to make because you can make all the fuel really quickly but to actually make the rockets it was PVC and then um, there's kitty litter involved there's a whole thing to make it. Um, when I found this out about him, I was like, I don't even know. <laughs> if you're curious, Kitty Litter is straight clay. And it's really great for making the end caps to rockets. Um, and so building that, and it took several, like it took, a, like I think it took two whole days in the middle of my summer um, to make 90 rockets. And I was like, this is, and I went through those rockets like in a few hours, like, oh my God, it took a couple days. Like this was ridiculous. This doesn't scale. Um, and slowly and slowly started getting more and more into software because I figured the reach was the reach was bigger. Like that's the whole point of doing a software company is you, you can. Um, I tell this uh, to anybody. I tell this to a lot of people in calls of um, the biggest um, like U.S. steel company that's I think got bought by a Chinese company not too long. I think sometime last year and it sold for like forty billion dollars, which is a lot of money. At the same time, Figma was getting bought by Adobe for $42 billion. So the biggest steel company in the U.S. was worth less than a tool that I go and make stupid pictures. In. Like the scales are completely different. And so I think that's what like, kept leading me more and more into this space. Like, uh, and I think it also is what got Elias and I to, to really start working together. His agency, like they could do what we're doing right now. Like, I mean, they, he could have humans go in and, and help make tours for people. But how many people, like booking agencies, like a big one might have, what, 100, 200 people in their roster, or really big ones might have like a few more. We already have 2,500 users, and that's always bigger than most booking agency rosters. Mm -hmm. So the scales are just like not even comparable to apples to oranges. Yeah. But I, I love the I love the space connection. That's yeah. that, that's hilarious. We have a space nerd back there, Colin. So <laughs> oh, really? he would love to talk space. 
I was also in the Space Force before coming to Darden. Oh, and, really? And only if I knew about Kitty Litter, I would have told SpaceX and made our, our <laughs> rockets cheaper. It would make great for us. Uh, <laughs> wait, did you ever do, uh, at, were you ever by the Hyperloop? Um, or if that's... Uh, I was in Los Angeles. So I was yeah, next oh, to the cool. SpaceX factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in VC, shout out VCU. VCU went to the SpaceX's um, did Hyperloop, their Hyperloop competition got uh, oh, very cool. in the world. So we got to go out there and like, I'd say me Elon, but he like waved. Like that's the most we got. Oh, that's legit. Um, yeah. And work on the pods out in LA. Oh, that's that's super cool. Yeah, we we can share some more stories about about out there after this. I told him about the killer he was. <laughs> he was <laughs> like, we got metal Come on. printers, and I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> shut up, Elon. <laughs> okay, so uh, before we turn over the questions, is there any story that I didn't touch? Because I wasn't really going by the by the. No, this is a great conversation. Um, so, is, is there any story that you wanted to touch on? Before we turn over the questions, you're like, oh, no, no, no. Uh, maybe not a story, but maybe just like some takeaways or resources that could like directly help people. No, like, even better. Items. Yeah. I would say uh, for me to understand his mind more and like how to um, properly like scale up the business, I started reading a book called The Mom Test, which like everybody tells you to read like when you're starting up like a tech startup. Um, and, I, and I gave it a shot and I was like questionable or I was skeptical at first. I was like, I don't know if this will work, but it really shifted like another gear in my mind when I read that. I think that's a really good resource. Um, yeah. most books that people recommend to you don't read, I like, but most of the startup books that people read, I mean, read, please read books, but most startup books that people <laughs> recommend don't, but, uh, Ilias has read, like, I'd say the, the top ones. And yeah. after you read the bomb test, your calls got so different. It was terrifying. Yeah. I would say that's definitely a good book. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but you guys can search it up and look into it yourself. That's like a good, uh, resource or like platform that we use that maybe people could, I mean, the YC, I use YC pages all the time. They got tons of YouTube videos, tons of links like i i probably read yc stuff every day when i wanted to know what is a safe like there's a 45 minute yc talk on what a safe is like how the finances um and economics of it all work like what does it mean to be pre-money and post-money what's the difference between safe and convertible notes why would you do one over the other why you should avoid if somebody's like i would like to use something not a safe or convertible note why you should like distance yourself from the investor um how to be careful to not take investment too early on because the just like how the first 10 hires like are really make or break the first few investments you take while not looking like you're giving away a huge percentage of the company at the start when you, these are all saves. And when you actually go for a value round, it's like, oh shit, I did take a lot of, like, I did give away a lot of my company when that, when those saves actually convert. So why well, see, I mean, which is a classic of course, but those things are great. One last thing too, uh, build space is like an online accelerator program. We are not affiliated with them, but we went through the program a couple of times. It's like, imagine why see, but like, uh, a smaller it's, version yeah. of it, but online. And then there's, it's like Hogwarts themed. It's, it's really like interactive. It's bigger than a hackathon, smaller than a startup. Startup, exactly. yeah, there you go. And it's a good little entry point. It's like very gamified. Mm -hmm. They're fun. And, and it's what Ilias was, was used. It's really easy to like, um, to help market with that. And you can so, meet like, uh, going back to the technical co-founder thing, like there's a lot of people who are working on projects and stuff that, you know, they might end up leaving theirs to join yours. We actually, one last story, and then I promise we're done. No, that's one, fine. One last story, might as well tell it for Bill's case. So we were looking for like another engineer because he was swamped with a bunch of work. And obviously on top of building the app, he also has to get into meetings and uh, things of that nature. And so we found Armand who was working on a product in Build Space. I was talking to him a little bit and then I just said, screw it. I need to meet him in person because he's not going to do it if I ask him on the phone. I took a bus to New York and asked him to leave so he could join us and then work on tap in the program with us. I had known him for like two hours. He left his company, joined us, and helped us out. Yeah, he is a salesman. Yeah. 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 I'm telling you, <laughs> you work into your work. <laughs> and so, yeah, so Bill Space is like a really, really good uh, accelerator program, and they they brought a lot of value to us. That's it. Thank you, guys. I know. I, I got. I got one more. This one for um, like getting out of your normal like corporate like whatever you're gonna whatever MBAs do. Uh, and getting into that. <laughs> Wait, getting into Sweet, he said. Yeah, from what I understand. From what I understand. Um, in all the time I like I was at Capital One for for most of me being like a traditional software dev. Um, it was like four or five years I was there. Um, I think I had one happy hour the whole time, or like one time I met, and it, like obviously some of this was COVID, and that's that's why, but um, nobody ever had their cameras on in any polls. Like it's just like not. Like why be there? And it's also like there's a joke at Capital One that the longer you're there, the longer you're going to be there. Like you're gonna get stuck. Like if I have friends who every year tell me they're going to leave Capital One and they've been there for almost 10 years. Like every year they're like, oh, I'm gonna leave at any point. I'm like, have you applied anywhere? <laughs> no, you haven't. Um, so 
sooner rather than later, like get and do fun stuff, like working with tap, even the startup I was before this, when I started there in two weeks, I was flown out to Vegas for a um, offsite and watched guys gamble more than I thought anybody could gamble. And six months later, went to the Bahamas. And then a few months, a few months, uh, or a few weeks later, they paid for everybody to work at a, like a, my team of five people to come work at um, a WeWork in DC. And it was like, hey, compared to the Vegas story, this is chill, but it was like, it's nice. Like they, they seem to care about the people more. Like you have more of an impact there. You're like the company had 20 people. So you actually had like a significant difference. And then working with tapped, like you just get into more situations. You live life. I felt like I've lived more life in the past year. Let me tell you than any of the times at, at Capital One, I've been in Ibiza talking to Grimes' manager, been given, been given shots by a bunch of music industry execs who are British who will always give you shots. Um, and like we were talking with like ran like artist camps that are way out of my league that I should be talking to um, in calls because Ilias is a great settlement. Well, it's fun too, right? Because like when you're um, when you're like running a startup and it's like more tight knit, like <clears throat> you're gonna be able to go and meet people and like for example, somebody will come up to you and say, like, "Thank you for making tap. Like I got my show." If I worked at Capital One, nobody's going to thank me for working at Capital yeah, One. Yeah, yeah. It feels great. There's nothing wrong with working at Capital One, obviously. There's nothing wrong with working <laughs> no, at Capital One. I feel like this has been like an anti-Capital One. <laughs> <laughs> work at Capital One. Thank you for America. If, yeah. if your choices are those, just have them in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> we probably have people going to, going to each of those places. So. Well, we can actually help you. If you guys are looking for any references, he has been able to get a couple engineers. You want to go to these people. Yeah, yeah, you do want to go to yeah, Capital One. Yeah. 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 After this, he's got a lot of people he knows. If you want to live a little live life to the fullest, this is... Uh, I haven't lost my hair, by the way, but I feel like I have. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> Well, I look forward to the, how I built this podcast uh, to hear all these stories. It's yeah. going to be good. Um, so a- any any questions uh, from, from the conversation? Yeah, cool. yeah kind of. I'm, 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 we're in a similar space. I have a startup with a co-founder here where we're kind of integrating AI into performance feedback and trying to kind of re-engineer the way that companies do performance reviews. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm a little bit stuck around the conversation with a technical partner. So that was very helpful. Additionally, in terms of like the creative direction, the user interface, user experience, do you guys start somewhere like and get somebody, pay somebody a thousand or fifteen hundred to come up with like a well thought interface? Or like did you just kind of iterate on it until you got to that point? Uh, I, I would say we just iterate on it. Like, I mean, I'm a, it helps that I'm like decent at product design and like, I'm not a great front end dev, but I've become a great front end dev in the past year. Um, and I would say like, as a technical co-founder, my specialty now, like the thing I'm best at is I can get a MVP out in a few hours versus before it would take me like a lot longer, like maybe like a month. I can drop MVPs like crazy, but, um, I would say it's more important to, uh, and you might you might think differently, but, but, or you might have some other opinions on it, but I think it's just like, get the thing out. Like just if, even if it's on a Google sheet and the user experience is awful, like if it's fundamentally solves the problem, the initial users that you get on are going to be willing to go through the hurdle of the bad user experience. How many times have you tried to like download a, uh, a YouTube video or get the audio of a YouTube video? And it's like the, none of the, the user experience is awful, but you're willing to go open like eight tabs and try to figure out the right thing just to get the thing that you want. Like that's how the initial users are gonna be. They're gonna deal with the bad user experience as long as it gets them from point A to point B. Okay, that helps, thank you. Yeah, um, what's a, first of all, thanks for coming here. Um, what's a piece of advice from investors or any sort of feedback on your business that you're really glad you didn't follow? That we didn't follow? Yeah. What's some in my son? I like here's a uh there's I wanna be safe here because investment. <laughs> 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 like, like, I had some of uh, these and I know you'll agree with this one, where certain partners will tell you one thing and other partners will tell you another thing. And those things are conflicting. And now you have to think, how do I make two decks and send it to two different partners? Or how do I tell two partners two different things? But you know they talk to each other. Like they're going to talk to each other. You can't isolate those two guys. Um, so I've that's I've mostly the conflicting thoughts rather than I don't know what are those some bad like I have a, I have a good one that's pretty safe and I could answer your question, okay. but the investors will still like us. <laughs> I think um, very political, but I think the the best way to do it is like just because somebody is successful, it doesn't mean that they're always right. 
And if you're more involved in a space where you're seeing something because you're like on the lower level and maybe like a higher up couldn't see it because like for us, with uh, for us, um, like, let's look at like performers, right? I'm backstage with the performers. He's backstage with the performers. I'm in the studio with the performers. He's in the studio with the performers. We're hanging out and getting pizza with the performers, but the guy who's worth a hundred million dollars, that's a music exec. He's just reading data or, or data reports about these performers. We understand their emotional, psychological needs and what they actually want. They're not just numbers to us. And so if somebody comes in and they're like, oh, I have all this money and I know all these things and I've been right before because in 1990, I signed Eminem or I signed this guy. This means I'm always right. Sometimes yeah. it might be wrong. And so I think that it, it's good for you to go with your gut instinct and you shouldn't just make a change because somebody else told you to. You you know what you should be doing at the end of the day. Just go with that. Yeah, there's a, there's a statistical study out. And, I, and this is one of my favorite things. I, I send it to everybody that's not an investor. Um, <laughs> That, that shows that um, the biggest VC funds out there and the most prestigious and whatnot, same, I said the same thing with the first 10 hires, it's your first 10 investments for them that gives them status. If their first 10 investments are good, the fund is a Sequoia or the fund is an A16Z, the fund is a whoever. All the funds have the same probability of whether they're going to hit or not. No fund is, can, is a fortune teller. Like none of them are actually, I mean, there's some that are like just really inexperienced, but any really any fund is going to be fine the only ones that are that are good like the i've heard them i've heard some people call, call them like mits or funds like the sequoias and stuff like that um they're not actually better even though they think they really think they're better they're not actually better like the statistic like literally mathematically they're not better. and for all the investors online they, they think your investment firm's awesome though yeah. so. <laughs> it's yours we love you guys yeah. you're always right yeah, yeah. You're always so good. Good. Really seems to fit our time. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So I'm curious that from the idea to MVP, uh, did you involve the customer to collect the feedback or you mean just kind of develop the MVP and then release it? Yeah, no, we constantly talk to customers. And I think we were lucky because he was already building an app for musicians. And then I was working with a lot of different musicians as well. So it was just constantly like calling people and showing them like rough sketches and just getting feedback. Yeah, there's there's a lot of people who build, like, do do build their startup and sell. And we don't like at this point we're not like advertising that we that we were what, what we were building. If people knew us, people knew the brand. But starting from around December till around February, like I don't think anybody we weren't advertising what we were building. We weren't really posting about it. But the people who knew, like, we weren't keeping it a secret either. Like, we weren't in stealth mode. Um, we were still talking to customers all the time and getting their feedback because that's the thing that we want. And the more you talk to my customers, like everybody's going to tell you like the customer always lies or like um, was the Henry Ford thing. You can have any color as long as it's black. Like don't listen. Like there's a, there's a middle ground there of like, listen to them, um, but don't just take their features like verbatim, like figure out where the problem is and like figure out uh, where the problem is, what your value, like how you're solving it, what your exact value proposition is, and then test it. And the faster you can do that, the faster you're going to make a great product. And ask more specific questions too, because what I used to do, I was, I was, I would be like, Hey, uh, what problems are you facing? That's such an open-ended question. You should be like, run me through the last time you got booked at a show. Where did you get booked at? How did you get booked? What time was it? Yeah. Where, what, what were you wearing that day? Like get as specific as you can. So that way you have better metrics to go off of. Yeah. And AB questions. You've got so good at AB questions and you've got better at me at AB questions where it's like, um, you, instead of this, like, yeah, broad, like, what do you think of the app? Like, what is... Uh, when you go to the eye doctor and they say, do you like this one or this one? Like, those are what you're, that's what you're doing right, to customers. Like, do you like this option or this option better? And they tell you, and that's a, it's an easier, you're going to get better data that way. Thank you so much. Uh, one follow up on that. So how do you, how did you get you know, the first 10 or 20 customers? Did you just go call them and then ask for feedback or something like that? Well, like I said, we had already kind of known a bunch of different musicians and we just told them, hey, we're thinking about working on this. What do you think about it? And at the end of the day, if you're going to, let's say you don't know anybody, right? And you're going into an industry where you have no experience. And I would say there's no harm in just asking somebody how you want to better their life. Like you shouldn't feel embarrassed to be asking them, hey, how can I create a product for you that'll make your life much easier? Because we had some friends that are starting startups and they're like, oh, I don't want to hit up this artist. He's going to think I'm weird. He's not. You know, and if they do think you're weird, it's fine. They think we're weird. Yeah, we are weird. Okay, one guy, um, the the last artist, I just I didn't the uh, one who was with Kenny. Oh, uh, when we were doing user interviews, um, he was like, "You didn't ask me a single thing of like how I like the app." 
I was like, yeah, I just want to know what your process is so I can better the app. Like, I don't want to know what features you want on the app. I'll figure out the features, but tell me like what your process looks like. And he thought he was like, this is weird. I was like, this is fine. It'll work. It'll work out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're at time. So thank you so much for, for coming here and talking with us. That was awesome to hear both your, your experiences from two like very different angles and how that comes together. Yeah. Super cool. So th thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you guys for having us. Yeah, for sure. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's been great. I also.